I now give the floor to the representative of Pakistan who has also requested uh, uh, to, uh, to exercise their right to reply. Before I start, I hope the distinguished uh, Indian delegate is present and listening and not running away from the truth like his colleague did in the morning. Mr. President, the Nazis are often credited with perfecting the art of concocting lies and peddling false propaganda. But listening to the Indian representative today, even the Nazis would acknowledge that the mental has now shifted to their BJP RSS acolytes. The Indian right of reply was another shameful attempt to deflect attention from the real issues. India, however, will not be able to escape accountability for its crimes. In his statement today, the Prime Minister of Pakistan shed a spotlight on Mr. Modi's India, which is defined by its oppressive and brutal occupation of the land and resources of Jammu and Kashmir, the egregious human rights violations of the Kashmiri people, the deliberate promotion of the supremacist Hindutva ideology to suppress and marginalize India's minority communities, including millions of Muslims, the expansionist Indian designs against Pakistan and all other neighbors of India, and the avowed aim of New Delhi to act as a regional bully. These are all objective realities, Mr. President, not partisan facts. As India's descent into a fascist state accelerates, the projections which my Prime Minister made last year of the imminent disaster being fueled by the BJP RSS policies are being confirmed now by their brutal actions. We need to look no further than Shaheen Bagh, a Muslim majority neighborhood of Delhi. As peaceful protesters, mainly Muslim women, took to the streets in February against the discriminatory anti-citizenship laws enacted by the BJP RSS regime, Hindu zealots perpetrated a well-organized and orchestrated pogrom of Muslims in order to teach the traitors a lesson. Countless Muslims were killed their homes burned, their properties looted, their places of worship desecrated, all with connivance and complicity of the Indian state. The charred streets, Mr. President of Delhi, not only exposed the Hindutva ideology in all its intolerant glory, they also manifested the trusted method that the Hindu extremists have resorted to from Gujarat in 2002 to Delhi in 2020 to address the Muslim menace, just like a certain Mr. Gold Walker, one of the ideologues of the RSS and the revered Guruji of Mr. Modi had instructed. Mr. President, it's no secret that the architects of the Gujarat massacre were also the masterminds of the Delhi pogrom. Just like the victims of Gujarat, the victims of Delhi will no doubt search in vain for justice in this new bastion of fascism. Meanwhile, the perpetrators of these crimes will continue to enjoy impunity and will be encouraged to spill more Muslim blood to further consolidate their hold on power and to eliminate all vestiges of India's Islamic heritage by destroying its grand mosques and monuments, just like they did with the Babri Masjid, and an attempt to change India's history by obliterating the thousand years of Muslim civilization and culture. It's a tragedy, Mr. President, that state institutions in India have also become the willing agents of this ominous Hindutva agenda. A former Chief Justice, whose last act before retirement was to hand over the site of the destroyed Babri Mosque to the Hindu extremists to construct a Hindu temple in its place, was immediately rewarded with membership of the Indian Parliament. Mr. President, in Jammu and Kashmir, India has no other claim than that of a military occupier. India is compelled to use naked force to impose its occupation on an unwilling and oppressed people. Ask the people of Jammu and Kashmir and they will tell you emphatically, Jammu and Kashmir is not a part of India. It never was and it never will be. The state of Jammu and Kashmir is an internationally recognized disputed territory. As decreed by the Security Council, the final disposition of the state will be made in accordance with the will of the people expressed 
through democratic methods of a free and impartial plebiscite under the auspices of the United Nations. The indigenous Kashmiri freedom struggle, Mr. President, seeks to realize the implementation of the resolutions of the Security Council in exercise of their inalienable right to self-determination. The Kashmiris have a legitimate right to resist Indian occupation by all means at their disposal. This just struggle cannot be denigrated or described as terrorism. It is the occupying state which is guilty of terrorism against the occupied people. Like all oppressors, India continues to believe that it can subdue the legitimate Kashmiri resistance through brute force. In its playbook, the alternative to suppression is even more suppression. But like all colonial oppressors of the past, India will fail in its strategy of occupation and oppression. Kashmir will be free one day. This is not only a lesson of history, it is also an imperative of justice, Mr. President. As Martin Luther King famously said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The Kashmiris are not alone in their just struggle. The people of Pakistan, people of the Islamic world, and indeed all freedom-loving people of the world are with the valiant people of Indian-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Mr. President, we do concede that India knows a lot about terrorism. It is, to use a popular expression, the mothership of terrorism which holds a patent over state sponsorship of terror. India has used terrorism against each of its neighbors, against its own people, and against the innocent people of Indian-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. India is actively involved in orchestrating, financing, and providing logistical support to terrorist organizations like TTP and JUA to target Pakistan from across borders. It has hired and organized criminal groups located across our western border to conduct terrorist attacks in Pakistan, especially to disrupt the development of the western and southern regions of my country. Commander Kulbhushan Yadev, an Indian intelligence agent captured by Pakistan has confessed that he was organizing and supporting these criminal groups to perpetrate terrorism in Pakistan. Pakistan and our entire region faces Hindutva terrorism as well, Mr. President. The BJP RSS extremists continue to espouse the fiction of Akhand Bharat or Greater India, which represents their desire for a unified subcontinent dominated by the Hindu religion, where minorities either convert to Hinduism or become second-class citizens. And Mr. President, the Indian government is also responsible for the worst form of state terrorism against the oppressed people of illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Over 100,000 Kashmiris have lost their lives under the brutal Indian occupation spanning over seven decades. Not one Indian soldier has been punished for crimes against humanity and these atrocities. Despite India's wishes, the international community can clearly see through the Indian hoax of presenting itself as a victim of terrorism. Mr. President, we must confront and defeat terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. This goal cannot be accomplished without confronting the terrorism of hate and ambition which currently emanates from fascist ideologies, including Hindutva extremists in India. Instead of tilting at windmills, India would be better served to put its own house in order and to strive for regional peace based on equality and mutual respect and a peaceful settlement of disputes. I thank you, Mr. President.